Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we are going to explore psychic healing research. And with me is my dear old friend, Dr. Elizabeth Rauscher, a pioneer physicist, author of several books, including Orbiting the Moons of Pluto, Complex Solutions to the Einstein, Maxwell, Schrodinger, and Dirac Equations, and also the Holographic Anthropic Multiverse. Dr. Rauscher was featured in a book by MIT professor David Kaiser called How the Hippies Saved Physics, Science, Counterculture, and the Quantum Revival. Welcome, Elizabeth. Thank you very much, Jeff. It's wonderful to be back with you and to explore uh, where we're going now with what we did earlier. And it's just great to be here. It's a pleasure to be with you. You and I go back a long time. I remember the time I first met you when you walked into the Institute for the Study of Consciousness where I was living in 1973 in Berkeley. Oh, yes. Uh -huh. <laughs> and since then, you've done an enormous amount of research in many different disciplines. You've published, I should say, about 250 scientific papers, or should I say more than 250. More than, because I yeah. have to keep track of them all. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and what we're going to look at now is some of the classic studies that you have done with Dr. Beverly Rubick in the area of psychic healing, working with uh, a well-known healer of that era, uh, Olga Worrell. Yes, I, I'm very interested. What, what I did is, in my endeavors in psychic research, I'm an open-minded skeptic. Now, what I mean by that <coughs> is I'll consider all possibilities, <coughs> but I apply this to conventional physics as well, or conventional science or conventional ideas, because you need to be open-minded to all kinds of possibilities but skeptical and not just accept everything. So with that in mind, Dr. Beverly Rubeck and I designed an experiment with Dr. Olga Worrell to... She's not a medical doctor, we should no, say. No, she had an honorary degree. Of theology, as uh, I, I recall. I think it was a theology, but yes. But she's a very well-known healer. Very well-known Russian aristocrat. And so what it was that I had the opportunity through John F. Kennedy University, then in Arenda, California, to work with Beverly, uh, or to work with Olga. So immediately I thought, well, all the mechanical PK kind of devices that she might affect, she's not into that. She's into biology, mm -hmm. she's into healing people. Yeah. So. Uh, Beverly Rubeck was part of my fundamental physics group that's in David Kaiser's book. So I asked her whether she would participate with me and we had a little grant and so then we designed this experiment to look at the motility or movement of bacteria and growth rate. And so she chose Salmonella typhimurium, which is a mild pathogen and the Escherichia coli, because when you grow the bugs, the Escherichia coli stinks after a while. <laughs> so, the salmonella may give you gangrene or something, but it, it, won't, it won't stink. And so um, I had not met Olga at that time, and mm -hmm. she came out. She was based in Baltimore, as I yeah, recall. Yeah, she, she and her husband, her late, uh, uh, she's deceased now. She and her husband had a wonderful place in Baltimore, which I later visited. A healing church. A healing church. Mm -hmm. And there were all kinds of stories. Like she would have people come up and she'd do a laying on the hands healing. And she'd do it for about two to four minutes. And so she had people come up 
and she had this one man uh, that had a tumor on his face, a really big tumor. And the statement was, even by MDs, that she they just saw the tumor disappear, sink in, disappear, and the cancer was cured. And so there are all these kind of stories. Well. And she was very open to working with scientists. She understood the scientific method. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you more about that because it's fun. But what she what she what I felt was instead of working with humans, we were going to do, you know, you introduce a a controlled wound and oh, you know, it's just too complicated to look at a simple bacteria system. Mm -hmm. That's quite interesting, and what salmonella and other bacteria do is it's called chemotaxis. They move towards food and away from de uh, shit. They go, <laughs> they basically away are environmentally are conscious. They're environmentally conscious. Mm -hmm. They go towards the good stuff and away from the bad. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so she, she came out and we're set up at UC Berkeley Life Science Building to do the experiments. Well, of course, she comes in with her pillbox hat and her mink coat, mm -hmm. and we're, <laughs> we're trying to smuggle her in. So we're trying to throw a lab coat off her, mm -hmm. over her. And she comes into the lab, and what we have is a room that's 37 degrees centigrade, which is the optimum growth for the bacteria, mm -hmm. and then a control. Uh, system down the hall that she won't interact with and she said well I hope you got controls dearie because hmm. that's the way she talked mm -hmm. and she understood to not affect the controls to infect what was she was entreating mm -hmm. so we had multiple test tubes um, sealed against any physical contact I mean we had all the protocol down and Beverly was terrific. I mean, this was a landmark experiment that she had done uh, for her PhD at UC Berkeley in biophysics. Mm -hmm. And so um, it's part, the first psychic experiment she had done, but she caught on right away quick, mm -hmm. you know. And it's a lot of things. It's about making a positive environment. It's true of any experiment. Whether well, there, there's an irony in this particular experiment in that you were asking, if I understand it correctly, Olga Worrell essentially to send healing energy to these bacteria which are, as you say, mild pathogens. I asked her about that mm -hmm. and she <coughs> said uh, we showed her in a dark field microscope and they look like little light dots moving around uh -huh. and she said oh they're cute little critters mm -hmm. and so I said I explained to her it's a mild pathogen so she says I heal the highest form of life I'm near and so they're the highest form of life I'm dealing with, so I will only heal, mm -hmm. which is interesting because I'll tell you about working with another healer mm -hmm. on the same experiment, a similar type experiment. So what we introduce in the motility, which is the movement, and you can see a move right. of the, like little dots. The more they move, then the you know, more the, alive and happy they are. The more they happy are. they are, basically. Yeah. It's about being happy. And really the question is, is there an optimal state of health for er any organism? Mm -hmm. Is there a state in which we're normalized, we're reasonably in good health, our ATP metabolism and everything's working right? And I think there is. I mean, this is a question that Beverly and I asked. So mm -hmm. uh, in the motility experiments, you uh, would put introduce core and ventricle, no, um, um, tetra we use tetracycline, chloramphenicol, and phenol mm -hmm. as antibiotics. So mm -hmm. we made them ill. Yes. So we show her the well ones, mm -hmm. and then we add phenol. Now they will remain modal for about 12 minutes until the slide uh, on, in the microscope die dries mm -hmm. out. And so they little light dots that move around and they get fewer and fewer as time goes on. And you have a precise, I guess it's a spectrographic analysis oh, yes, to yes. determine exactly uh, how uh, active uh, they are. A zener light source mm -hmm. and a calibration so it counts the number of moving dots. And it's like looking at particle tracks, really very similar. Mm -hmm. How long they are, how many little dots there are, and so forth. 
so she um so then we add the um um, antibiotic and what happens is they die in about one or two minutes mm -hmm. so there's no motility right. in the control mm -hmm. in the treated what she did is cup her hands near the slide but mm -hmm. she did not touch it yes they remain modal for 15 minutes mm -hmm. was a good count number mm -hmm. amazing you know it just was and she says i hope you keep these slides for ever well the thing is of course they're useless after 15 minutes because it dries out mm -hmm. so beverly put them aside but made her think that we we're going to keep them mm -hmm. and um but of course you kept the record of we what kept occurred. the record mm -hmm. so we had all that recorded mm -hmm. and uh it's very interesting because motility is fast moving growth is slower so you're measuring like the rate of enhanced health mm -hmm. as well as the enhancement of the health. Mm -hmm. So you do different doses of the antibiotics. So in the growth studies, we had sealed test tubes, three in the group, they were all coated with the controls coated and the uh, treated coated. And it was really tricky because Beverly and I had a grad student code them. So we wouldn't know when we analyzed the data later whether it was a treated or controlled. In other words, uh, what we call a double blind experiment. A double blind experiment. experiment. Mm -hmm. So motility, uh, in the growth studies, you do about 24, you can do up to 48 hours of growth, which mm -hmm. means every hour you have to go to the lab and measure the growth in a spectrophotometer. Now the first one we used was a nice standard Beckman, which I've used before. Then one time we did four major studies with replication in all studies, mm -hmm. which is very important. And all the controls were like the background of what's known for that bacteria with no intervention. Mm -hmm. In the treated sample, she, she would hold her hands there for two minutes. Yep for each batch of test tubes. So we had multiple test tubes, so we had redundancy. It took me months to analyze the data. I <laughs> drew little graphs and mm -hmm. stuff. And um, she was very, very cooperative, very patient, and very good at understanding the scientific protocol. So the first one was a Beckman spectrophotometer. And what you do is you take a sample from the test tube at each hour and then you put it in the Beckman spectrophotometer which measures the opacity. Mm -hmm. So the more bacteria, the more opaque it is mm -hmm. to the light coming through. So we measured that and um, then of course what happens is if they're well, they call, uh, grow in what's called the J-curve. They start out slow and then they grow really fast exponentially and then top out mm -hmm. uh, when they use up their food source. So there's a carbon source in there for them to eat. Mm -hmm. And of course then, because it's a closed container, there's a, uh, excrement, which means that the, the waste is yeah. also influencing and that's why they top out sure. after about 48 hours. Mm -hmm. And it's a kind of a opalescent fluid, so it kind of looks nice in the test tubes. Mm. So the first test tubes we used were glass. We even used plastic, didn't seem to make any difference. Mm -hmm. And then we did a dose response. We added like 10 milligrams, uh, uh, mil uh, milliliters of chlorine phenicol, 20 and 40 and different amounts. So mm -hmm. of course the more antibiotic, the more sick they became and the harder to heal. So yeah. that showed up mm -hmm. as correct and it also matched over the four major studies. So mm -hmm. Now let me just backtrack a little because I understand that somebody might say since she held her hands near the test tube. I got an answer for that. There was a, a physical effect, heat or oh, electromagnetic oh, energy. Was, she had a hidden magnet in her tooth and stuff like yeah. that. Okay, what we did is take grad students mm -hmm. that were blind to the meaning of the experiment mm -hmm. and ran the whole experiment with grad students cupping their hands. We figured they probably weren't healers. 
You never know. <laughs> but you never know. Yeah. But we had them cup their hands and then read the whole experiment with someone naive to the purpose of the experiment mm -hmm. to not introduce a healing effect and they were just exactly like the controls. Mm -hmm. And there were some interesting predictions like she said there'll be extra growth in test tube number 20 dairy. Mm. Because that's the way she taught. Yeah. We took the pill, bo bo <laughs> pill uh, <laughs> box hat off, you know, mm -hmm. a few things like that. But anyway, the first one was done at Life Science, and then I did the next one. We did it at the Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory, and we had a spectrophotometer that was worth about a half million. Mm. And the whole side of a room would be covered with this instrumentation. And all I came down to is the little cuvette holders weren't as good as in the little spectra, Beckman, which is about like that. <laughs> but uh, so the the arrow bars were a little bit bigger, but mm -hmm. every replication was very well replicated with amazing effects. And if I recall correctly, this uh, experiment, you ran it over a few years. Four years. Mm -hmm. We did four major studies mm -hmm. over four years. Like a year apart each? Yes, mm -hmm. partly because it was raising the funds. Yeah. And the Holmes Foundation of Los Angeles was one of our funders, mm -hmm. which I give them credit for a very nice group. Related to the United Church of Religious Science. Yes. That's what it was known as then. I think they're now called the... Yeah, Centers for Spiritual Fellowship, or uh, oh, I think so. Some, yes, something along but, but those they lines. But were, they were doctors mm -hmm. and uh, other professionals, so it was a very diverse group. At, mm -hmm. you know, and then of course we reported our findings. But uh, we did two more studies. One I had arranged to part of UC Berkeley at the Richmond Field Station, mm -hmm. and then this is interesting because I mean Augur was great. Mm -hmm. The only thing we had a problem with is she had to fly first class, which used up about half the grant money. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I, I analyzed the data, and Beverly did a wonderful job. It was a really good experiment. Well, our viewers should know that this experiment, which is now a couple of decades old, if, uh, it still stands as a classic of uh, research in the field of psychic healing. It, it's so controlled so, uh, I mean, I think that my design and then working with Beverly was so important. Mm -hmm. Now, other people tried to replicate it. Now, here's what happened. Of course, they had different healers. I mean, Olga Worrell was really quite an extraordinary classic, healer. Classic uh, person. Mm -hmm. You know, she was so cooperative. She was so knowledgeable. She was a really fantastic healer and a very lovely person. And other researchers have worked with her and also reported quite astounding effects as I recall. Very much so. She did some work with uh, like a cloud chamber yes. and uh, made it look like more particles were present. Yeah. And then there were several replications. Now what happened I think she was worked with Wilbur Franklin, a physicist at Kent yes, State well, University. Yes, and he had done some very interesting PK metallurgy work with mm -hmm. electron microscope work mm -hmm. similar to what we had done and well uh, we could talk for a long time but, about but some explain of this other research what happened with some of the replications yes they didn't instruct the healer that there were controls so mm -hmm. the controls were anomalously affected uh -huh. so the statistical difference wasn't as great mm -hmm. but the controls didn't fit the baseline so mm -hmm. they were all healed because it was like the target is to heal this mm -hmm. but anything like it looks similar to the healer so psychically he could go down the hall 50 feet mm -hmm. and heal the controls as well as the treated. Well you know I, I, I know one uh, parapsychologist has criticized a lot of healing research saying just because you have a difference between your experimental group and your control group how do you know that it was the experimental group that was healed and not the control group that was harmed? Well the control group matched all the mm -hmm. previous many, many years Beverly, of in this case, had been yeah, doing Beverly these was, studies for yes, years yes, and, and had, had a... Uh, a good baseline. Mm -hmm. And also, her research advisor had done this work for 15, 20 yeah. years. So actually, it had like um, 
millions of of example baseline mm -hmm. so yeah. when the controls meet, met met the criterion of the baseline yeah. i don't think there was any problem so, but you're saying in the replications in the replications they didn't distinguish but you see even Aga the control knew, group didn't match the baseline in that's other words. the point yeah and so what August said was, you know, you got controls theory. So she understood that 50 feet down the hall was an equivalent lab mm -hmm. with the controls to not affect them. So that was a choice, like how far yeah. does the field go? What is your intentionality? How is it focused? How do you develop from the spiritual healing or psychic healing she's doing into the lab so there was a lot of wonderful factors that we had to deal with mm -hmm. that really made it uh, work so well and the people involved in our assistance were so wonderful and cooperative now there are many different views about psychic healing. Of course, some people think it's all suggestion. Other people might go so far as to say it's all fraud. Uh, some people say it's about prayer. They're praying to a higher power. Other people say it's a psychokinetic effect, that mind over matter, the healer is directing energy according to their conscious intention, which seems to be the way Olga Worrell was working. Uh, I, I actually explained that by talking to healers. Mm -hmm. Now what I have found the best healers say they come they bring the energy from a higher state mm -hmm. because if you're just using psychokinesis you may be using up your own energy mm -hmm. and often healers get ill. In fact there's rituals like with the indigenous people and the medicine men because mm -hmm. they have to rid themselves of the disease which they take on to mm -hmm. get rid of it mm -hmm. from the person they're trying to heal. So all those factors come into play and um, it's important to distinguish but what I think is on the idea of, uh, you know, the controls is how we presumably dealt with fraud and the bacteria are not something Olga World had no idea what system she was going to work with so I mm -hmm. don't think she brought any salmonella with her. Mm -hmm. And the reason I thought about salmonella is you, how, how suggestible are they? Are you going to be able to tell the salmonella, now you grow better because I'm telling you this. <laughs> So they're not suggestible like people, and that's why I went with that, because there are other experiments where you can introduce a small wound, cover it with a plate, yeah. look at the rate of healing, but that depends on the different subjects, uh, state of health, mm -hmm. and we're doing 10 to the 8 bacteria in a test tube, and it would be a really huge project to just run a, a, a hundred human subjects. So we answered that, but just in case, the night before, I asked the salmonella for the permission to do the experiment. Mm -hmm. So they'll say, oh, well, that gets into prayer, but I'm not sure that really influenced it. Well, you know, these days in parapsychology, I think it's widely understood that any experiment is a whole system. We don't know whether uh, the experimenters or other observers might be exerting a, a psychic influence on the experiment. Exactly. Now, let me give you some examples when I, uh, I'm mostly, my background's in theoretical physics, but I've done a lot of experiments. I had a whole chem lab. I built telescopes and cloud chambers. and I started building rockets, but then I went to college and didn't have time to mm -hmm. <laughs> get into that. But I've worked with a number of groups, both as a theoretical collaboration and experimental. And my idea was working with the accelerator at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, the Bevatron, which no longer exists, is why not PK a particle? Mm -hmm. So you need to choose a particle. So I was going to do a Lee Wicks vacuum state, see if I could get the grad students to PK it, and then we get a bigger grant. Well, <laughs> it was partially a joke. Yeah. But I did do some experiments with influencing the rate of radioactive decay. Mm -hmm. And um, some, it's like, I think every experiment has a psychic component. Now, of course, electronics, everything is hardened against psychic uh, influence. 
uh, it's linear. So the more nonlinear system is like a living system, mm -hmm. the more subject it is to influence by external mind effects. Mm -hmm. And so what I did is I, I did a six hour experiment mm -hmm. and I'd have them concentrate for 15 minutes and I have them agree to slow down the rate of radioactive decay. Mm -hmm. So they all agreed to that, so mm -hmm. the effect would be similar. Yes. Then I ran them around the hall so they wouldn't think about it in between and then do another 15 minute session. So I got about a 4% effect. Mm -hmm. But there is a literature where there is deviation from the rate of radioactive decay and it all bridges between about 2 to 5%. It's mm -hmm. very interesting. Yep. With different um, different ways there, of doing There's now quite a large literature on, right, uh, on yes. that sort of phenomenon. It's typically called micro-psychokinesis. Right. And I would say in the groups that worked at the Bevatron, there were some groups that just clicked. They really cooperated mm -hmm. and uh, they worked well together and others that didn't. And the difference in all factors, like the background noise and mm -hmm. so forth, was majorly affected. I, I mean, mm -hmm. uh, so I'm not sure that you can't do an experiment and completely exclude psi. Uh -huh. Because I asked the students and the professors, I said, I said, what's your purpose in doing this experiment, the, the Bevatron experiments? Mm -hmm. And they said, I have no purpose. And I said, no. I don't believe that. I mean, you know, like the grad students, you want a PhD, you, uh, whether you want to prove your girl, prove it to your girlfriend, you're smart, or your parents, or whatever, or get a job, or you love physics. There's always a motive, mm -hmm. and that's very critical to look at in any of these the, experiments. The human the, element. The human element and all the humans involved mm -hmm. in their intentions. Yeah. Well, we have so much to learn about this, but you, Elizabeth Rauscher, have been a very important pioneer in the field. Thank you so much for sharing this half hour with me, and I look forward to future conversations with you. Thank you very much, Jeffrey. I really appreciate it. I enjoy it. I always enjoy talking to you. And thank you for being with us. <laughs> Thank you.